So yeah, that's the update from Kate and me uh, regarding what we are planning to do for functional safety. So um, generally speaking, when we're looking for functional safety, we're performing safety analysis on a system level. And when we look into uh, today's systems, it's not a monolithic one-time development that you want to plan, develop, and ship. It's a, a bundle of modules that are put together, that are modified, that are pre-existing, and so actually, yes, yeah, some are come from the open source domain. So we have, yeah, several layers, microcontroller, the um, uh, hypervisor layer, maybe different operating systems, different applications, the tool chain associated with it. So there's a lot of uh, stuff to think about what is actually within your system. So, I think how many people are familiar with functional safety in here? Oh, more than I thought. <laughs> um, so when you speak about safety as a difference to security, it's uh, the freedom of unacceptable risk of phys physical injury or damage to the environment or health or whatever. And uh, the functional safety part is that part that um, describes um, that the system operates correctly or operates as defined, also maybe in anomalous uh, situations or if something internally breaks or how to avoid things to break internally at all. And so it's mainly talking about uh, yeah, avoidance measures or detection measures and safe states that you will have once you detect something that's uh, not normal. So generally in functional safety, we are aiming for, on the one hand side, having a system architecture that in itself is safe, that it's sturdy enough to perform safely in any condition that you can think of. And on the other hand side, we need to provide the evidence that we not only planned to have a safe system, but actually that we have implemented and shipped and tested a safe system. So. Generally speaking, doing functional safety always results in a lot of documentation that you provide along with your system that you ship or with your software that you ship. So yeah, I know safety is a system property, so you can't say this software module of the complete system is safe, so my system is safe. So. Um, uh, safety is not plug and play of safety certified components. It's a system property. But yeah, with all the components that you plug together, it's not only that they have to support your safety concept. They in themselves need to provide the documentation that they have been implemented as intended, that they have the properties that they claim to have. So generally speaking, yeah, that the software you're pulling into your system can perform or is uh, capable of performing as intended. So, so the evidences that you usually ship with your product, um, they are usually uh, uh, defined safety standards, fo safety standards usually focusing, yeah, that you everything has a unique ID, that uh, you have traceability between your components, that you can uh, have a complete uh, set of stuff, uh, that you have the evidences that you have everything and when we, let's say, translate this into yeah, our software language, it's about defining your dependencies inside of your product and keep these dependencies up to date. So as creating a system these days, as I said, it's, it's not a one-time process. It's updating things. It's also fixing issues, fixing security issues. So also we need to have requirements and um, means to prove once we have done a change, once we have done a fix, that we are done again with all our documentation, that we can prove that we have done everything as intended and that we have shipped a proper product again down our supply chain. So um, also here we can use the S-bombs as already also used by security providing machine readable information for assessing if a system has the safe safety capability for being used in another system. 
so these days, um, what st uh, staff safety standards are looking for, like unique IDs and dependencies of a component, that's something that you can find these days already in the SBOMs. But what you currently can't find is the documentation, uh, user manuals, um, requirements, uh, product architecture, test coverage, um, all that stuff is something that, on the one hand side, we can already describe this as PDX requirements pretty well, but that has not been done yet. So when we look into a functional safety project, so FUSA is uh, for functional safety, uh, the internal dependency model we are still thinking of is in most cases a V model that you have higher level requirements, you break them down into an architecture and a design that you use for your implementation and then you integrate stuff step by step and you test stuff step by step and everything is done based on a foundation of plans, of guidelines, of uh, validation, verification measures so um, that you have this V on, on a proper base. So why were we starting to think about using SPDX? So when we look into what stuff needs to be done for functional safety and we are all engineers and yeah, we like to have uh, fantastic systems and most cases we also like to maintain them. Do we like to, to apply a process? Yeah, mm, it might help, it might, might bother us, but yeah, it's okay. But ensuring all documentation, evidences are there, that we described everything, that we pull everything together, that's usually, that's a pain because we have everything in our heads already, we have everything implemented already, it's running, it's a big no-no, it's a big pain. So this is really the thing where SPDX can help a lot. So, Actually, FUSA projects and FUSA documentation, the, it generally always looks the same. We have documents that are plans, guidelines, process descriptions. We have uh, uh, requirements like yeah, functional requirements, non-functional requirements, architecture design, and we have all this verification stuff, evidences, uh, safety analyzers, whatever. And actually, the current data structure in functional safety projects, most of the cases, um, we have these silos of documentation in our life cycle. Uh, plans are still mostly PDFs or in a kind of wiki or in a QMS system. We have requirements somewhere in another life cycle management system. There's the code, thank God, usually in some kind of repository these days and that's, let's say, the only thing where, at least in my opinion or in our opinion, um, everything is already really within, yeah, proper configuration management and proper traceable. And then you already also have the verification evidences that that might also live in their own system. So once you want to do an update or you want to do a configuration of your system, traceability usually breaks somewhere, you need to have a manual process, um, spreadsheets are your biggest friend, so that's really something where the machine readability ends and the pain starts. So um, when we look at the, the life cycle of a product and when we think about the S-bombs and the S-bomb types, um, actually we can create or generate S-bombs about functional safety evidences and documentation when we have the data available. So really starting from the design as bomb when we plan a system, maybe for the first time, when uh, we have all these stuff saying, yeah, this is the fundament, that's, that's the foundation of how we plan, how we structure, that's our safety concept. Uh, we do all the implementations, all the requirements, we have all the source code that we can uh, uh, push into a source as bomb So actually we can follow this whole life cycle with SPDX and safety in mind pretty neatly. So. Yeah, so every, every um, kind of documentation or evidence that we create with functional safety actually fits very well in the already defined SBOM type model. So really from designing and planning to building to um, the configurations that you might deploy here or might deploy there and that you have co uh, maybe collected runtime data, logging data that goes then also 
during the lifetime into a runtime as well. So actually it's, let's say when I come from the automotive world, there's a lot of problems that I see in actual projects where you have config data, where you have runtime data and where do you put it? How do you package it? Where do you find it? So that might be our solution. So um, when we look into the current 2.3 dependency uh, relationships, that already work pretty neatly to, uh, to, to uh, create our dependency model. 3.1 will be even better. So generally, when we look into the structure of a generic project, we can say, okay, yeah, plans, guidelines, and the safety concept, that's a pretty stable thing that can go into a design as form that really describes what do we have, what do we want, and then all the stuff um, regarding detailed requirements, regarding architecture, um, test descriptions, source code, that's, that you use later to build something, can go to, to the source as bomb, and then yeah, with all the uh, build definitions, your build tools, uh, you can have your build as bomb, and that's more or less how when you deploy and run things, goes down the same chain as um, the standard SBOM lifecycle. So we are currently piloting this concept on the Cephar project. So for those who are not familiar with Cephar, it's a small RTOS um, free operating system. Um, it was started already with safety and security in mind, so there's a lot of structure already there. Uh, it's permissive, permissively licensed, so it's open source. And um, yeah. So what we currently have with Zephyr is, yeah, it's the RTOS, uh, there's a build system available, there are test cases and test frameworks, so everything that you really want to have. And from the safety uh, viewpoint, we are currently creating the functional safety evidences, the management plans, analyzes, traceability, all, all uh, requirements, all that stuff that we need for safety in addition. So when we cu currently look into the project itself, yeah, we need to have, or we have a safety development plan, we have uh, safety claims, we have high level software requirement specification that really p uh, p uh, can um, form the design as bomb that's really describing how we want the sources to look. Sources in that sense really mean um, coding guidelines like it's um, how to, uh, to create code. On the other hand side, the detailed uh, component requirements, so what should the code do? And then on both levels, also the evidences that you have tested this, that you have maybe reviews or static analyzes that you complied with the coding guidelines. And on the other hand side, you have uh, a component or unit tests that show you that uh, the software behaves as intended in the component. And we can take this one step further and say, okay, once we have built everything, um, we still can deploy or can create these relationships to see where does stuff come from, where are the depend dependencies, where are, is the information source. The real beauty really starts on this once you, you have an issue. Because, yeah, there's a famous impact analysis in functional safety where you start looking for about what is affected, what is the root cause, what do I need to do, and usually that's something involving a lot of experienced engineers that are sitting together and discussing, oh my god, where, what do we need to do? And then um, pulling stuff together that they need to change, that they need to update, and um, actually, the more complex a project is, when we think about layers of components and modules that form a complete system, the more, let's say, variables you have that can go wrong, or maybe even it's not deterministic, the outcome that you can maybe not even really see, am I complete with my impact analysis? And actually, yeah, when we have all these nice relationships set up, and we can really see, okay, my executable behaves weirdly. And let's see, yeah, where could this problem be? It could come from the sources, but it also can co come from my build chain. Maybe my tool chain is some kind, uh, is weird in some kind. So, 
and you can really um, um, trace this really back automatically where it could stuff um, uh, have gone wrong um, from requirements back to high level requirements maybe so that you can really follow the complete chain of problems and then follow uh, the chain back when you implement the changes back to the issue that you might have. So, and then hopefully pressing one button one day and generating the complete new set of evidence with your new safety as bombs in every level that you need. So an uh, important uh, um, topic is requirements traceability for not only safety, but I'd also say quality and everything where you want to so see what will I get when I use this. And um, things can go wrong. Oops, so, so you will really be able to see the requirement. Has it been implemented? Where is what um, components are affected by this requirement? Where are the tests for this requirement? Where are the test reports of this requirement? And you might, yeah, have or you will, you know, might have. You will have an issue there because that's how things are. You, or you will have a CVE here one day. And there you can really then also use this to trace back where the re, uh, reason for this might be. And the reason really might be that your requirement has been insufficient that you might want to create or need a, uh, another requirement for this and then set up again new traceability for this requirement. And for the new requirement also a new task that you also plug in, in into this framework of uh, relationships. So it really enables you to always have a view of an, an actual real-time view of, of what is in your system and what are the dependencies within your project, not only to the outside stuff that you might pull in, but also within your project. So the main, yeah, the, the, ma the main uh, benefits that we will have with this profile is really that we have the complete model of dependencies. It's not, we have something here, something there, and something in a book, and some information you will get in the, uh, on the water cooler or in the coffee kitchen. Um, and really, you will be able to have deterministic uh, impact analysis methods. Um, there are a lot of methods around, but um, you can really use this as input of then doing an FMEA or an Ishikawa analysis or whatever you want to do. But you have, de uh, you have really defined sources and dependencies to do this. And yeah, it's really, I think it, uh, the reproducibility uh, of everything, you will always have the same impact analysis. You will always have the same set of evidences for what you have done. And it's a very formal way then to uh, provide the completeness evidence. It's not like in the end of a project or at the end before you release something, somebody sits down with a spreadsheet and says, okay, do I have this? Do I have that? Do I have these stuff? It's just you can generate this, you can have it, and as long as the tooling works, you can, make sure, you can be sure that you have everything. And when we think about, yeah, this infamous V dependency model, actually you can really sort everything in as bombs as we have them today. You can hook things up with relationships inside of this dependency model so that you can really have everything from plans to stuff how you do things, from requirements to implementation to test. So it would be great if you could join us. Uh, we are meeting each Friday, so European time, it's Friday at five, Central European time, and yeah, in the mornings in the US. 10 Central in the US. Okay, and yeah, any questions, please contact Kate or me, or yeah, just see us on Friday.